Well, praise the Lord, folks. It is 7 o'clock on Wednesday evening. That is time for our midweek Bible study. We greet you this evening from uh, Decatur, Alabama, just outside of Huntsville, uh, at our home. And we greet you this evening in the wonderful name of the Lord Jesus Christ. We are uh, continuing our Bible study this evening. Um, we have been looking at the topic of, <clears throat> excuse me, LGBT affirming theology. At least that is the title that I have given this study. Um, it's uh, I think it's been interesting. Hopefully it's been enlightening for many of you. And uh, I think tonight you're going to get some really good information. <clears throat> and I repeat, many people think because of the title I've given this study that it is uh, exclusive and benefit to LGBT believers, that is not true. Uh, every single Christian can absolutely benefit from that which we are looking at. And I believe tonight uh, there'll be nothing different. It'll be very much the same. It'll benefit you greatly. If we can go to the Lord in prayer, <clears throat> excuse me, as we begin our study tonight, Father, we thank you, God, for this opportunity once again to go into the Word of God. Lord, there is no greater gift that has ever been given the human race than your sacred text. And sadly, Lord, there are many who have turned it into a instrument of hate, an instrument of abuse, uh, Master, I, I can't understand it because I understand the nature of your word to be a love letter to the human race. And Master, today we ask God that the anointing, the presence and power of the Holy Ghost would rest upon us as we study this marvelous document today. Help us by the leadership of your spirit to understand the truths of your word, Master, that we might joyfully enter into the fellowship of your church and the communion of the Holy Ghost. Anoint tonight, O oh God, both the teacher and the student. Let us today with gladness receive that which the Spirit would speak unto the church. For we ask it in none other in Jesus' wonderful name. Amen. Uh, I have a habit. I mentioned last week that I have a habit sometimes of kind of jumping back and forth and repeating certain things. Uh, and I do this on purpose. This is not something, you know, don't think, well, the preacher's losing it. That's why he keeps doing this. No, no, the preacher's not losing it. I know good and well what I'm doing, and I'm doing it on purpose because there are important imperative truths that we must understand or else everything else is worthless to us. There are truths today, my friend, that many, most, I might say, in the evangelical fundamentalist church world, there are many things that they have polluted, twisted, perverted. They do not understand certain truths when it comes to New Testament salvation and New Testament uh, Christianity. And for that reason, they misinterpret and misunderstand all kinds of things in the Word of God. We, as uh, a progressive church, 
that understands LGBT affirming theology, we are in danger of falling into the same identical traps that many of our sibling churches in the mainstream world have fallen into over the years. And so therefore it is imperative as I teach, I am constantly going to be going back and reminding you of certain truths and certain realities uh, because a progressive Christian people cannot risk falling back into the old mindsets and the old um, convoluted ways of thinking, convoluted ways of interpreting scripture and understanding New Testament theology and New Testament Christianity. We were talking last week uh, in part about the notion of, I was talking for a while about the fact that uh, morality by definition simply means uh, a society's norms, you know. And uh, so to say that um, something is in and of itself immoral and therefore just by reason of its quote-unquote immoral nature it is going to erode society and blah 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 um, that that's it you're getting into an idiotic loop because the reality is if that particular thing is uh, the norm for that society then it's it's not going to have any negative impact on the society because the side the society has no problem with it um i can give you some examples just you know of societal norms for instance um when i visited the united kingdom many years ago uh, Folks in the United Kingdom drink very differently than anything I was ever accustomed to seeing. You know, anybody in the U.S. who drinks like they do over there, you'd be a fall on the floor, flat out, bombed, drunk, you know. You'd be seen as a full-blown alcoholic, you know. Because, man, I mean to tell you, they're having alcohol with lunch, and they're, you know, and they're... I mean, it's, it's, they just have a whole different approach to the consumption of alcohol than we do here. And uh, does that mean that, you know, they're wrong, we're right? Well, not necessarily. And please, I don't want anybody going off on a tangent. Oh, see, the preacher said drinking and getting drunk's fine. That's not what I'm talking about, so don't, don't be getting foolish on me. I'm simply talking about the difference between societies and how they approach certain issues, you know. And so because they approach it a certain way and we approach it differently here, it would be idiotic for us to stand here and pontificate and say, well, we're better than they are. You know, we're, we do it right. They do it wrong. Um, not necessarily, you know. And so... Uh, morality or accepted societal norms vary dependent upon the culture uh, that you are examining. Um, okay, I'm, I'm trying, trying to make sure I start where I left off last week. As I recall, last week... I had left off speaking of, okay, oh, yeah, okay, yeah, all right, I'm trying to figure out, I'm sorry folks, I'm trying to figure out, I should have done this beforehand, I'm trying to figure out if I want to do this first or go into that first, okay, yeah, let's, let's go ahead. Hang on to all those thoughts I just threw out there. And let's go ahead and go back 
to where we left off last week. Last week, I left you with a quote from my friend Sam Cater's book, Openly Gay, Openly Christian, How the Bible Really Is Gay Friendly, page 50, paragraph 4. Sam writes, all the things condemned in Leviticus 18 and 20 were what the idolatrous nations were doing. They did treat Zakar to be remembered as if he were a common prostitute and did it in the name of idolatrous religion, end quote. Now, in keeping with an understanding of properly dividing the word of truth, Paul said, study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. You can study passages in the Old Testament. You can try to understand them. You can try to interpret them. You can try to apply them. But if you approach it from the perspective of every passage stands alone, every passage has its own meaning and its own application in and of itself, you've already lost the battle because Paul told us, he told Timothy, study to show thyself approved unto God a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Got news for you folks. When Paul wrote those words to Timothy, there was no New Testament. The New Testament did not exist. Paul spoke to Timothy uh, in other places and told Timothy, you've known the scriptures, you've studied the scriptures. Timothy had a very, very um, excellent education in scripture. His parents had made certain as a young Jewish boy that he had received the best possible education in uh, Jewish teaching and Jewish learning. Timothy was very devout. He was very well studied. And here Paul says to him, you know, study. Yeah, by all means, invest yourself in the Word of God. He said, but rightly divide it. This is where 99% of evangelical and fundamentalist Christians go off the rails. And this is why there is so much wrong teaching, hurtful teaching, abusive teaching within the church world because they do not rightly divide. I grew up, every little tiny portion of a scripture, they pull out five words and act like there was a message in those five words all by themselves. And it doesn't work that way. Those five words have to fit in like a piece of a puzzle. They have to fit into the message of the whole. Therefore, if it appears at face value to conflict with the message of the whole, how can we understand it so that it properly fits like a puzzle piece? And the Lord told his people in the Old Testament through the prophet line upon line, precept upon precept, here a little, there a little, said this is how I have disseminated my word to my people. I've given it to them in little bitty pieces. It's up to you to put those things together. Again, I use the analogy of a jigsaw puzzle. You know, you've got to put it all together. But you put it together to create one general picture. Okay? And so, when we're looking at any single point in the law, We've already looked at Leviticus 18 and 20. We've talked about what um, the Lord was saying to the Jewish people. I've broken all that down. But I cannot afford to leave you there. Because if I leave you there, I've done no better than the television preachers and the pastors you had as a kid 
who pulled things out of context and did not present it to you in terms of how it fits into the whole, okay? We've talked about in this study, we've talked about the fact that as we're looking at Old Testament passages to begin with, we have to be mindful of several factors. One, the law was given by God to Moses for the Jewish people, period. End of the story. Nowhere, nowhere when God gave the law to Moses, nowhere does God say, I want you to go throughout the world and evangelize this message and teach Gentiles to embrace this law. Teach them that this is how I want things done. No, nowhere, nowhere. The Word of God also tells us that the Old Testament, the Scriptures, when you read the word Scripture in the Bible, it always, 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 without exception, refers to the Old Testament canon. Always. The New Testament was not even compiled. It was not even fully written at the time that those words were inscribed in any of the writings that we find today in the New Testament canon, okay? So when they wrote the word Scripture, they were always speaking of the Old Testament, always, without exception. <sighs> so it's imperative to understand the law was given by God to Moses for the nation of Israel. The scriptures tell us, the word of God, the New Testament passages tell us that the Old Testament is given to us for as types and shadows. It helps to create a, how, how do I want to say this? It creates an elder sister that we're able to look at and we're able to learn from her successes, and we're able to learn from her mistakes. So God is forever saying to the church, the church is Rachel, Israel's Leah. You remember uh, Jacob married two women? The first one he married, uh, he was tricked into marrying the older sister Leah. Then he wound up working another seven years so he could get the sister he wanted originally to begin with, right? But he wanted to marry to two women. That is a type of Christ and God in the church. There's Israel, which is the first wife, and then you have the church. That's who God really wanted to begin with was Rachel. But he started with Leah. Do you follow what I'm saying, okay? And so when we look at Leah, when we look at the history of Israel, and we look at the interactions between God and Israel, we're literally seeing a type for the church. Well, preacher, I don't quite get what you mean. I'll tell you what I mean. God's law, his New Testament law, what he expects of his people, he expects of his people. He doesn't expect us to run out and try to force the world into doing what we as the church are called to do. Can I make that any clearer? The same way that he established the law with Moses for the nation of Israel, so the rules, the standards that God sets for the church today, I'll give you a couple of examples. He calls us to 
uh, obviously to higher attributes like humility, love, so on and so forth, um, uh, compassion, uh, charity, those are the higher virtues. But in terms of behavioral standards, for instance, the Lord expects us not to visit harm upon another, okay? He expects us not uh, to be hurtful or harmful to anyone else. Um, he expects us to treat others as we wish to be treated. If the church believes that abortion is wrong, listen to me carefully, then people in the church should not be getting abortions. But does the church have a mandate from God to go out and force others outside of the church into having to embrace the standard that he's established for the church. No. No. We've been down this road before, folks. Carry nation. Anybody know who that is? Do you remember that name? Prohibition. Bunch of Christian ladies decided that drunkenness and alcohol were evil. In America, we had to establish a constitutional mandate that alcohol be outlawed in the U. Glory to God! Every American ought to be sober. Every American ought to avoid the evils of alcohol. And these idiots in the name of God ran around with axes destroying stillaries, destroying, uh, you know, uh, alcohol that's been stored for consumption, you know. Uh, they, they're going into bars and tearing up bar rooms, you know, and all these things they're doing in the name of God, trying to force society as a whole to embrace the sobriety that they believe God had called the church to. This is where fundamentalists and evangelical Christians get it all wrong, big time wrong. And they start to behave more like their mother, the Roman Catholic Church, who for centuries tried to enforce its rules upon every society it was able to conquer and bring under its control. And this is why you had the Inquisitions, the Spanish Inquisition, and you had uh, the... Uh, uh, the, the murdering and the torturing and the deaths of millions upon millions of people in the name of Christ. Of course, we look back now and historically we say, well, that was wrong. That was, we shouldn't have done that. Yeah, but we're still doing it. We've still got people in the church world today doing the same stinking stupid thing. They're going right down the same identical path. And I guarantee you if, you, if they're allowed to get away with it, uh, with this issue or that issue, honey, it is just going to turn into a landslide. It's going to snowball. After a while, they're going to decide there's something else besides abortion that we need to control. We need to outlaw masturbation. We need to outlaw this. We need to outlaw that. Next thing you know, you got a cop standing in your bedroom. Even if you're a married couple, make sure you don't do anything as a married couple that government hasn't ordained and government hasn't approved of because they decided that this type of intimate activity is not appropriate. And somebody sits out there and says, oh, pastor, that's crazy. No, it's not, folks. 
No, it's not. That is the danger that we face when you begin to tell people what they must do with their own body, what they must do in terms of decisions uh, that ought to belong to them and them alone. You can try to moralize. You can try to make every argument you want to. But your arguments should only apply to the church. So yeah, believe everything you be believe. Life begins at conception. Believe everything you want to believe. Preach it in your pulpit all you want to. But you're an idiot and you're ungodly and you're wicked if you think that God has called you to somehow bring your standard that God has given to you for you and inflicted upon the young believer or upon others. I was talking the other day, the, I've done a lot of study on abortion, for instance, and do you know that the Jewish faith teaches that life begins at the birth of the child? And according to the Old Testament law, that is a fact. The Old Testament law never, never did God put the value of a human life upon a fetus. No. Nope. That, that, if a woman was killed and she was pregnant, uh, no, nowhere in the law did God say she was guilty of the mother's life as well as the fetus, as though the fetus were a separate person or an individual. No, it's not how Jewish law works. There are Jewish organizations all over America who are fighting against the new laws and the new rules being created by certain political people. Uh, relative to abortion because they do not share the evangelical fundamentalist viewpoint and beliefs concerning unborn babies. And yet in this country we have a certain group of people who are wanting to push their viewpoint and force everyone in this country to embrace their viewpoint even though there are major religions in America that do not share that viewpoint. There are all kinds of people. And I'm talking religious people. I'm not even talking about unreligious people. But I'm saying even religious. There are various religions in America that do not embrace the same viewpoint. Do you follow what I'm trying to say? So we need to be careful about trying to force what God calls the church to embrace upon unchurched or non-church people. But we're talking about the law. And as we talk about the law, if I leave you simply at Okay, no, this is what God was really trying to say. This is what God was really trying to get at. Then you're going to walk away from that study, and you're going to say, okay, I, I, I understand. So when somebody comes at me, and they're quoting the law, I understand what it really is was trying to say. Yeah, but the problem is, listen to me, the person who's coming at you with that to begin with, has missed the point entirely on the nature and the application of the law. And for that reason, it doesn't matter what their viewpoint is on that scripture. Got news for you. Doesn't matter what your viewpoint is on that scripture. Doesn't matter how you and I understand that scripture. Because in the end, it's a moot point. Why? Because the law is not binding upon you and I today. The law was not given even 6,000 years ago, 4,000 years ago, 2,000 years ago. 
The law had no application for you and I. The only way the law would ever have become an issue for you and I is if we decided we wanted to move to Israel and become part of the nation of Israel. We wanted to become a citizen. Then that law would have had implications for us, okay? Say, well, Pastor, why is that important? It's important, folks, because if you're simply going to go tit for tat with people who have got news for you, are going to believe what they want to believe no matter what you say. Doesn't mean, listen, those people could care less about how enlightened you are. They could care less about how educated you are. They could care less about how much you've learned and how much you've come to understand. They're not interested. They're, they're, they're so far removed from truth, it's not even funny. They don't care. We've seen that in the last seven years with the arrival of the great demonic evangelist, Donald Trump. We've seen that the religious right could care less about the truth. They don't want truth. So if you think understanding these Old Testament passages, if you think understanding these Old Testament laws are somehow going to give you some advantage or give you an upper hand or help you to feel better about something, uh, you're mistaken. In the end, it still is incumbent upon you, the Word of God said, let every man be convinced in his own mind. So you still have to get out of that mindset of trying to please or trying to explain yourself or trying to justify yourself to this other group of people because it's never going to happen. But by the same token, if you're going to live for God and be saved, now you, you keep living like a dog and be lost if you want to. I'm not going to be lost. The Lord helped me understand 30 years ago that I had a place in the church and that who I was didn't offend him in the least. He understood me when nobody on this planet understood me. God helped me to understand that 30 years ago. Honey, I've got my ticket for glory. I'm going to heaven. I'm looking forward to seeing Jesus and spending eternity in the presence of God. But there are millions of LGBT people who are going to just slip off to hell anyhow. And it's not because they don't understand Leviticus 18 and Leviticus 20 correctly. No, because frankly, it doesn't matter how you interpret or how you understand those passages. If you don't understand the role of the law to begin with, if you don't understand that the law has no weight in your life, Life today whatsoever as a New Testament born again child of God if you don't understand that then it it doesn't matter what you believe concerning do you follow what I'm trying to say this is why it's so imperative to me when I'm teaching that if I'm going to go into these Old Testament passages, I have to keep coming back, I have to keep coming back, I have to keep coming back, and I have to keep pounding on this truth. You must understand the role of the law. You must understand the nature of the law. You must understand the application of the law. You must understand, listen to me, children, the expiration of the law. On the day of Pentecost, after redemption's work, salvation's work was completed, the Lord had ascended. On the day of Pentecost, when Jesus Christ, by reason of his Spirit, descended upon the church, which was at that time able to fill one auditorium, the upper room, 
in Jerusalem. And when he descended in invisible form, having told the disciples that the spirit of truth has been with you, but he shall be in you. He said, I will not leave you comfortless. I will come to you. So when he, by reason of his spirit, returned to the church in the form of the Holy Ghost, so that he would no longer dwell with us as an individual human being, but he would dwell in us as the omnipresent spirit of Almighty God. He breathed life into the church, and that day, that minute, that hour, the law expired. Salvation was no longer contingent upon the law in any way, shape, size, or fashion. The law no longer played a role in your salvation. And when Peter preached and the apostles, those gathered 120 in the upper room, when they preached in the streets of Jerusalem that day, under the influence of the Holy Ghost, speaking a number of different languages, people who had come to Jerusalem to celebrate the Feast of Pentecost, hearing the good news of Jesus Christ being preached in their own tongue. And when they asked the question, what shall we do? You're telling us this man, Jesus, was born. He lived a sinless life. He died on the cross. He was buried three days. He rose from the dead. He ascended. And now you're telling us he's living inside of you by reason of the Spirit of God because he and God are one. Okay, what do we do now then? <laughs> we understand all that. But what do we do? How do we apply this good news, this gospel message. And Peter's answer, repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. And you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost for the promises unto you and to your children to them that are afar off even as many as the Lord our God shall call. LGBT person, I have good news for you today. You can do that. You can do that. If you try to satisfy one single, one single point of the law, the Apostle Paul said, you become indebted to the entire law. So the minute you become convinced that this Old Testament law has anything in the universe to do with your salvation today, guess what? You're bound now by the whole stinking law. There are over 500 individual laws that you are required to embrace and follow because, again, according to the Apostle Paul, the law works in a very simple fashion. To offend at one point, you become guilty of all. So in other words, if you want to put it in modern vernacular, if you get a speeding ticket, it's all the same as if you committed adultery, as if you molested a child, as if you committed rape, as if you committed murder. All the laws now fall upon your head simply by having broken one of them. So you make a choice. Do you want to live under that, or would you rather simply believe and obey the gospel? All the Lord said is repent, turn around, turn from unbelief to belief. Change your direction. Stop living your life as though God did not exist. Understand God is real. The Word of God said, that uh, for without faith it is impossible to please him. For they that come to God must first believe that he is. And, 
there's a great big ant attached. Now listen to this. And that he will beat you down if you don't do everything right. Oh, no, it doesn't say that. Wait a minute, that's what my pastor said growing up as a kid. That's what Ron Parsley says on television. Everybody who don't do just right, God heaps judgment down upon them, according to all these idiots on television. We're not called to put our confidence in what these dingalings on TV say. We're called to put our confidence in the Word of God. And the Word of God said we must first believe that He is, listen, and that He is a rewarder of them that diligently seek Him. Oh my God. The promise of God's word is not that God is going to heap judgment upon those that don't look for him, but rather the exact opposite, that he rewards those who do. Hallelujah. That's why the scripture tells us, the New Testament tells us, draw nigh unto God. What's going to happen? He'll draw nigh unto you. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. As we draw nigh unto God, it's kind of like a bully. The enemy is coming after us, and we start running toward daddy, or we start running toward our big brother who's muscular and strong. And what happens? The closer we get to our big brother, the closer we get to daddy, what happens to the bully? He starts to pull back. He, oh, hallelujah, I'm going to get happy. Glory to God. Whoa, glory. The closer we get to God, the enemy starts to pull away. That passage is not telling us to do two things. Draw nigh unto God and resist the devil. That is, that's not what he's, that's not what that passage is telling us at all. No, that passage is telling us that the way to Resist the enemy is to draw nigh to God. In drawing nearer to the Lord, we are offering resistance to the enemy. The closer we get to our strong and powerful, mighty Savior, our mighty God, all of a sudden the enemy starts to pull back. All of a sudden the enemy starts to put distance between us. Because he knows that the word of God promises concerning our God. Listen, he is an ever-present help in time of trouble. <laughs> he knows the closer we get to daddy, you better believe daddy's going to stand up for his kid. Hallelujah. The closer we get to our big brother, you know big brother's going to Stand up for his little brother. Do you follow what I'm telling you today? And the enemy knows that. Well, I'll tell you something. The enemy believes God's word. Even if you don't. An LGBT believer, I'm here to tell you today. All God's called us to do is to turn from unbelief to faith. He's called us to be baptized in the name. This is not how it's done in the majority of Christian churches today. But the Apostle Peter said plainly, in the name of Jesus Christ. Why? For the remission of sins. So he told us what to do. Repent and be baptized. How? In the name of Jesus Christ. Why? For the remission of sins. He didn't, leave, he didn't leave any room for interpretation. He didn't leave any room for controversy or confusion. He explained very clearly, here's what you do and here's how you do it and here's why you do it that way. Then he offers a promise. There's a promise attached. He said, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost said, if you'll do these two things, 
God will honor your faith. And sometimes, depending on where a person's faith is at, they may receive the Holy Ghost before they ever get to the water. Because there's no uh, exact set order in which these things must occur. Repentance has to occur. So Donald Trump, who calls himself so-called a Christian who has never repented, who's never felt the need to repent, got news for you, honey. You cannot possibly be a biblical Christian without having repented because according to Peter, you got to repent before you can be baptized. You got to be, repent before you can receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. And, and uh, repentance is essential to New Testament Christian theology. Huh. So there's no excuse for LGBT people. There's no excuse. There's... There's nothing barring you from the kingdom of God. There's nothing barring you from experiencing all that God has for you. Now listen, in keeping with an understanding of properly dividing the word of truth, it's important to consider the words of our Lord concerning the law. Now we've been looking at passages that are part and parcel to the law of Moses. What did the Lord say concerning the law? Let's hear. Matthew 22, 35 through 40. Then one of them which was a lawyer. What, what does a lawyer do? A lawyer is an expert in what? The law. They represent the law. When, the, when we read this in the New Testament, the lawyer <laughs> is someone who has studied the law of Moses because he's in Israel. This is a Jewish nation. They are under the law of Moses. Therefore, this man is an expert in the law, okay? He asked him, meaning the lawyer asked Jesus a question, tempting him meaning the lawyer had less than honorable motivations for asking the Lord this question. He was actually thinking he might trip the Lord up a little bit. And saying, Master, which is the great commandment in the law? Basically what he is saying then is this, which of the laws would you say it's at the highest level of priority. Jesus said unto him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment. But Jesus didn't stop here. He kept talking. He said, And the second is like unto it, meaning it is equally as important. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Listen to verse 40, Matthew 22. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Okay, Pastor, I, I, you read it to me, but I still don't get it. I don't know where you're going. Folks, people misunderstand and misconstrue the law. They misinterpret passages from the law, including those that they claim relate to LGBT people. Not that it matters because the law is no longer binding anyway. But Jesus, in four or five verses, helped us to sew up the law in one neat little bow. He put a tiny little bow on the entirety, not my words, his, on the entirety of the law. 
He said, oh, the law, the law can be summed up very easily. Number one, passion and devotion for God. I'm, I'm simple. I'm just going to put it in simple words, okay? Serve the Lord passionately. Serve Him with devotion. Don't be half-butted about how you approach your love for God and your service of God. No, serve Him passionately. It says, and love your neighbor as you love yourself. The golden rule, whatsoever you would that men should do unto you, do ye even so unto them. Treat people as you would wish to be treated. The Lord said, on these two things hang all the law and the prophets. Huh, well, that's interesting. According to the Lord, the whole of the law is contained within these two simple principles. Giving God your all. I'm going to read them to you in a minute. Commandments 1 through 3 out of 10. And loving your neighbor and treating them as you would wish to be treated. Commandments 4 through 10. Do you know what didn't make God's top 10 list? You know what he didn't even tack on as number 11? Because nobody told God he was confined to only 10 laws. If he'd have wanted to make it 11, he could have made it 11. But he didn't. Somehow, a prohibition on homosexuality, which according to certain people in the Christian world, is the greatest offense to God that could ever be committed. Yet somehow, that prohibition didn't make God's top ten list. I wonder why. Hmm. There has to be an explanation. Well, there is. Jesus gave it to us. Matthew 22, verse 40. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. What two commandments? Well, love God passionately, serve Him with passion and vigor, and treat people as you wish to be treated. The Ten Commandments read in this fashion. Listen. Exodus 20, 1 through 17. And God spake all these words, saying, I am the Lord thy God, which have brought thee out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. Number one commandment. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them nor serve them. For I, the Lord thy God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children unto the third and fourth generation of them that hate me, and showing mercy unto thousands of them that love me and keep my commandments. So, so the first commandment is relative to idolatry. Verse 7, here comes the second commandment. Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless that taketh his name in vain. Verse 8, commandment 3. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Okay. Six days, verse 9, shalt thou labor and do all thy work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. In it thou shalt not do any work, Thou, nor thy son, nor thy daughter, thy manservant, nor thy maidservant, nor thy cattle, nor thy stranger that is within thy gates. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, 
the sea and all that in them is, and rested the seventh day. Wherefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. So the first three commandments are related to our relationship with our God. The next seven have to do with man's relationship to other human beings. Chapter, uh, verse 12 is commandment 4. Honor thy father and thy mother, that thy days may be long upon the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee. 13, verse 13 is commandment 5. Thou shalt not kill. Verse 14, commandment 6. Thou shalt not commit adultery. Verse 15, commandment 7. Thou shalt not steal. Verse 16, commandment 8. Thou shalt not bear false witness against thy neighbor. Verse 17, commandment 9. Thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's house. Thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's wife, nor his manservant, nor his maidservant, nor his ox, nor his ass, nor anything that is thy neighbor's. Looks like something didn't print. Anyway, okay. <laughs> so I, I don't have the tenth here. But anyway, all right. So the Lord Jesus said that the entirety of the law hinges upon two basic concepts. Loving God passionately, serving Him passionately, and secondly, treating others right. I'm going to put it simple. Treating other people right doing right by other people. Somehow, stealing got into the Ten Commandments. Coveting got into the Ten Commandments. Lying got into the Ten Commandments. Bearing false witness got into the Ten Commandments. But homosexuality didn't. How is that possible? Well, let me see. Could it be because what two people do consensually is not meeting the criteria of not treating people as you would wish to be treated? Could that possibly be it? Could that possibly have anything to do with why that wouldn't fall under the purview of the commandments? Because according to Jesus, all of the law and the prophets is summed up in those two principles. Serving God completely, fully, wholly, passionately, and treating others as you wish to be treated. Not doing people dirty. Not mistreating them. Not robbing from them, not stealing from them, not visiting upon another human being any form of physical, emotional, or um, uh, financial hurt is what it basically boils down to. Could that be why homosexuality didn't fall into the top ten? I think it's a good possibility. It kind of makes sense to me. And then when we look at the New Testament, when we look, where in the world? I've got so many notes here that sometimes I get, I get them a little mixed up. When we look at the New Testament, there were Jews who were trying to convince the Gentile believers that they needed to embrace points of the law. You remember what we were just talking about a little while ago? And 
they were trying to convince Gentiles, for instance, that they had to be circumcised. Because circumcision was like the biggest issue when that lawyer came to Jesus and said, which is the greatest commandment? Honestly, he may very well have been thinking circumcision is the biggest one. And then the Lord shocked him because the Lord approached it from a whole different perspective. He approached it from a higher perspective. He went up, said it's not about the specific rules and regulations. It's about why those rules existed to begin with. And those rules were laid out plainly. The reasons for those rules were laid out plainly. <clears throat> you follow what I'm saying? And it boils down to loving God with all your heart, serving Him with passion, and treating others as you would wish to be treated. But now in the New Testament, we had Jews, believers, Christians, but they were Jews, and they wanted to bring the Gentiles under the law. They wanted to start introducing matters of the law. And the disciples and the apostles gathered in Jerusalem to consider this matter. They said, okay, folks, we, we, we better take some sort of an official position on this issue. And this is what they come up with in Acts 15, verses 28 and 29. This is the conclusion. The Lord's brother James actually played a big role in helping them to kind of bring it to this conclusion. They said, for it seemed good to the Holy Ghost and to us to lay upon you no greater burden than these necessary things, that ye abstain from meats offered to idols, and from blood, and from things strangled, and from fornication, from which, if ye keep yourselves, ye shall do well. Fare ye well. So the apostles said, if there are any matters of the law that as New Testament Christians you need to even be the least bit concerned about, I didn't say your salvation is contingent upon this. It didn't say you're going to heaven or hell over these matters. That's not what they said. They're not adding to the criteria for salvation. But they're saying, when it comes to the law, there's only four things that even are, are represented in the law that we feel like you need to really have concern over it all. And three of these things are related directly to idolatry. One of these things has an indirect connection to idolatry, but also includes some other things. Fornication. Now, here's what's funny. The church has adopted a definition for fornication. Well, bless God, homosexuality falls under the category of fornication. Glory to God, hallelujah. They don't say a word about child molestation. They don't say a word about rape. They don't talk about prostitution. They don't talk about religious sexual practice. Say, well, there's, we don't have that in our world today. Tell that to priests who molest little boys. Tell that to priests who convince their female parishioners that they're doing God a favor by having sex with the priest. Say, that doesn't happen. <laughs> you haven't read the same articles I've read. They don't talk about incest. Got news for you, honey. Those things are how you define fornication. 
every one of those things, you're visiting emotional, psychological, physical, or financial harm upon another. Oh, there's one other thing. According to Strong's Dictionary of New Testament Words, there is one other item that falls under the purview of fornication. Hmm. Let me see. Oh, that's right. Having sexual intercourse, listen to me, with a divorced person. Ooh. Let me tell you something, sweetie. If the Old Testament law is incumbent upon New Testament believers, if the laws that your favorite evangelical family member and your favorite right-wing fanatical fundamentalist lunatic neighbor wants to shout at you across the fence, if those laws play any role whatsoever in your salvation, then so does the law which states that a divorced person is not free to remarry until their former spouse has died. Remarrying prior to the death of your former spouse is considered adultery. Oh, wait a minute. <laughs> That's what Paul told us in the New Testament. Oh, <laughs> my mistake. That's what Jesus and Paul told us in the New Testament. We got people, and we're going to go into Romans 1 coming up. Got people say, well, bless God, even if you don't accept, even if you can explain away Leviticus 20 and 18, glory to God, hallelujah. That's New Testament. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and there's New Testament that says that a divorced person, see, God never, according to Jesus, God is not the author of divorce. And God never accepted or endorsed divorce. Jesus said from the beginning it was not so. You know the passage that certain people love to use against the concept of gay marriage? A marriage is between one man and one woman. Jesus said from the beginning it was not so. That passage, read it. Read it in context. You know what the Lord was talking about? Divorce and remarriage. That's what he was talking about. Divorce and remarriage. Oh, but they conveniently leave the last couple of passages, last couple of words, last couple of verses out because, oh, no, no, no. Oh, I don't want to get into that. God never invented, endorsed, or accepted the concept of divorce. Moses, Jesus said, Moses was the inventor of the concept of divorce. And what Moses said was simply this, in the eyes of God, once you've married, you're married for the remainder of your physical life. However, if it is too difficult for you to live with that person as husband and wife, then you can write an article of divorcement and you then can separate and live your own lives. But you're still married in the eyes of God. Your marriage has been dissolved in the eyes of men so that 
He is no longer responsible for that woman. She is no longer responsible to that man. However, until the former spouse has died, this is New Testament teaching, people. Until the former spouse has died, you cannot remarry. Because to remarry or to engage in sexual uh, activity after divorce, you are counted as living in adultery. Now there are Christians in the fundamental and evangelical churches who have adopted a Roman Catholic because it suits them. They'll tell you, we're Protestant, glory to God. Oh, we don't believe in the traditions and the doctrines of Rome. Rome invents doctrines that suit them. Uh-huh. Unless they're convenient for you. All of a sudden, a marriage ceremony in front of a preacher is this big sanctifying cleansing ritual that washes away all the past mistakes. So when you stand in front of a preacher and you make a covenant and you make a vow to another human being that you then proceed to break and divorce, it's okay that you now get up in front of another preacher, make the same stinking vow, the same promise, the same commitment, the same covenant to a whole nother person. Well, I, I hate to tell you, but I'd be a little concerned about your vow to start with because you already proved that you don't give a flick about swearing a vow. But again, the Word of God tells us in the New Testament, do not swear a vow. Do not make a vow. Uh-uh. God will hold you. When you make a vow, folks, in essence, a vow is, is people don't realize this, but when you make a vow, you're literally making a <sighs> commitment on your life. We take, in the modern era, we take vows, quote-unquote, very passively. You know, we don't give them a lot. People today don't know how to keep their word. You can't even get somebody to tell me they're going to be in church Sunday and them show up for church Sunday. Never mind make a vow. But when you stand in front of a preacher, you stand in front of a judge, you stand in front of even a secular you know, authority, and you make this commitment to one another. You can you make a covenant, and you swear vows to one another. Got news for you, sweetie. You're going to answer for those vows in heaven. God doesn't take vows lightly. So you better be real careful. Preacher, what are you trying to say? What I'm trying to say tonight is this. Remember I told you, I said, people who think that our study, LGBT theology, is exclusively beneficial to LGBT people? No, it's not. No, because there are many, many things here that uh, cross orientation lines in terms of application the minute you try to pull something out of the law into the New Testament you become bound to the entirety of the law so that person who wants to tell you that you have to live up to their interpretation and their, their understanding of Leviticus 18 or Leviticus 20, um, I hope they're on their first marriage and their only marriage. I hope they don't eat shellfish. I hope they don't, if they're a man, they don't cut their bangs or shave their beard. I'm serious, folks. I'm not joking. Because according to Paul, you become indebted to the entire law. 
there's no such thing as high law, low laws, important laws, less important laws. No, no, no. No, you go talk to a Hasidic Jew in New York City. I lived in New York City for 10 years. I used to love to talk to Hasidic Jews because they were everywhere. I lived in Brooklyn, and in the area I lived in, we had a lot of Hasidic Jews. And a lot of times I'd be on the subway or I'd be on the bus, and I would talk to them. You know, anybody who knows me knows I'm a pretty gregarious person. I'm not very shy as a rule. And I would talk to them, and I'd say to them, Sir, may I ask you a few questions? Um, please understand. And I'd tell them straight out, I'd say, Listen, I'm not trying to convert you. This is not that kind of a conversation. I am a Christian. I'm a theologian. I am a student of Scripture. But I, I want to understand the Jewish perspective. I want to understand Jewish thinking. You know, I want to understand how uh, the Jewish faith looks at certain things. And 99% of the time, they're perfectly nice, and they'd say, well, sure, you know, ask, ask me whatever you want to ask me. One of the first questions I'd always ask them is, who did Jesus, according to Jewish thinking, who did Jesus say he was? And that's how I, I word the question. Not one time in all the years, I lived there 10 years, not one time did any any, any, any Jewish person ever answer me differently. They always answered the same identical way. Jesus claimed to be God. Not once did they say the Son of God. Not once. They say, no, he claimed to be God. And if I say to them, well, but why is it that, you know, he employed the term Son of God? Why is it that the writers use the term Son of God? They'd say because in Jewish theology, if God reveals himself in a human form, we do not speak of him as God because God is not a man. Therefore, we refer to him as the son of, or a man who is the revelation or the representation of God. So that's how we approach it in Jewish thinking, which is why the Jewish writers of the New Testament use that phraseology. We understand, we can read your New Testament, and we understand every word they're saying exactly, we understand exactly what they're saying. It's you westernized Christians who don't understand what the Jewish writers of the New Testament were saying. Okay? So when you talk to these Jewish people, you ask them. You ask them. Well, you know, um, can a man be Hasidic? Can a man be a keeper of Torah, and, you know, and, and maybe he doesn't care to have a beard, so he prefers to, oh, no, 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 he cannot trim his beard. You mean he can't shave? No, he cannot trim his beard. What? He can't even put scissors to the bottom to neaten it up and tie, no, no, cannot trim his beard. Can, can he cut those little curly cute? No. Can he go outside his house without having that little square block that you all tie to your head, which you cover with those big hats? No. If you're going to keep Torah, you have to do all these things. All of them. There's not a single rule in Torah, not a single law in Torah that can be broken. Because the minute you break one, you've broken them all. Okay? So this is why I keep going back when we're looking at Old Testament passages and stuff. This is why I keep going back and saying, folks, I want you to understand what God was really saying. But I do not want you to understand what God is really saying so that you can, in effect, 
feel justified in being who you are. Uh, no, that, that's not the reason for that. That's not why I'm helping you understand. I want you to understand what God was really saying because there are very real, even modern day applications for what God was really saying. And if you misunderstand what he's really saying, then you're not understanding what he was trying to say. And you need to understand what he was, in fact, trying to say. But you need to always, always, believer, I don't care if you're straight or gay, cross-eyed or blind, you always need to remember that... We are not under the law. We are under grace. What gets you into heaven is faith and obedience to the gospel of Jesus Christ. If you have exercised genuine faith in the gospel and you've obeyed the gospel, you're going to live your life differently. Not because suddenly you're on a mission to make heaven by living up to some code or some ethic or some standard. No, no. The New Testament gospel is not, listen to me carefully, it is not a repackaging of the Old Testament law. <laughs> that, that's, that, that's how I grew up, okay? Basically, all the rules of the Old Testament law were still binding, except those Ah, oh, well, you know, except those that had to do with food. You don't have to eat kosher. You know, this and the plan, now that, and now this one, yeah, we did that one. The Lord really didn't care about that one. We could toss that one out, you know. And, but, oh, but this one, yes, this one's important. Homosexual, whoa, that's important. Oh, but this one on oh, divorce and remarriage, that's not as important either. Now, you know, God, no, because listen, if, if you stand up in front of a preacher and you make a vow to a new woman or to a new man, bless God, hallelujah, glory to God, all of a sudden your new marriage is sanctified in the eyes of God. That'd be grand if only that's what the scriptures taught, but it's not. But thankfully, for the LGBT person, as well as the divorced person, as well as the remarried person, thankfully we are under grace and not under the law. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So what washes away those things that the law might otherwise have condemned us for is simply an acknowledgement of our sin before God, living honestly before God. I don't go to God one single time in prayer and represent myself as some sinless person. Nope, too honest for that. <laughs> I'm too honest. I say, Lord, what you see is what you get, and I'm not trying to hide anything. I'm not trying to keep anything secret. Because I know I can't. But I trust the promises of your word. I believe, Lord, that you see me in a way that I can't even see myself. You see me today as something that I will be one day. But I'm not going to be that until you've come and redeemed us from this world and welcomed us into a new, glorified, sinless existence. Then I'll be everything you ever envisioned for me to be. But thank God, because of my faith and my confidence in you, you see me today as though I were already in that state of existence. Hallelujah. He calls those things which be not 
as though they were. All right, folks, I think tonight we're going to go ahead and bring this to a close. Uh, I believe next week we will be going into the New Testament finally. So uh, we'll probably be looking next week at Romans 10. And uh, I think you'll, re you'll really be, now that we've looked at the uh, Old Testament law concerning these things, it's really going to help you to put into perspective and understand everything Paul was talking about in Romans 10, because it all works together. Like I said, uh, line upon line, precept upon precept, rightly dividing the word of truth. All of a sudden you put the puzzle together and, and you understand Paul's entire uh, Romans 10 uh, writing because you understand better some of the things elsewhere. All right? Amen. We want to go to the Lord in prayer and close our Bible study tonight if you'll bow your heads with me. Master, we love you and we thank you, Lord, for the word of God. But more than the word, we know, God, we can become bogged down and muddied as we search through the scriptures if we're not careful. It's so easy, Lord, for the law to suck us in to this vacuum and to make us feel an obligation to rules and regulations. But Master, I pray for everybody watching tonight. I pray, God, that you would shine a light of revelation in their heart, in their mind, in their spirit. You would help them at this hour, oh God, to understand the role, the nature, the purpose, the function, the application of the law. Lord, that today you would help them in a brand new way to understand the truths of New Testament salvation as it is brought to us by grace on your part through faith on our part. Master, in the name of Jesus, help us to meditate upon that which we've heard. If there be any individual under the sound of my voice, Lord, who tonight has heard the simple, sweet message of New Testament salvation, and they desire to be saved, they desire to know you, to walk in fellowship with you. I pray, God, that you would give them the courage to repent, to turn from a life of unbelief, a life without faith and acknowledgement of God, and turn to a life of faith acknowledging the reality of our God. Lord, that you might reward them as they strive day by day to draw closer to you. Help them to find someone, Lord. If we're not available to them, help them to find someone who'll bury them in the waters of baptism in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. And then visit them with that holy promise from heaven of the gift of the Holy Ghost. And pour your spirit out in their life, empowering them to live the life of a witness and a testimony to your love, your grace, your compassion, and your kindness. Master, we love you, God. We're so grateful for your word. We're so grateful for the plan of salvation, and we're grateful for the opportunity to walk in fellowship and communion and relationship with you. All this is available to us through the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And we ask all this tonight in that name, even Jesus Amen. Praise God and amen. Well, I hope, again, I hope this study is being a blessing to you and encouraging you. Uh, God willing, you'll come be with us Sunday at 3 o'clock Central Standard Time uh, online if you live outside of Huntsville. If you live in the Huntsville, Alabama area, folks, I cannot say this enough. Church plays an important role in 
our walk with God. And if it is possible, we are called to fellowship with God's people. We are called to be part of the body of Christ. There are things we can only experience. There are benefits we can only experience through the uh, communal, corporate worship and gathering of God's people. And we need people to come and help us worship with us, pray with us, work with us. What we're trying to do has the potential of rocking Rocket City right off its foundation. If we can realize the vision that God has given me for a church, we will blow the minds of your worst critics. We will blow the minds of the most judgmental, critical, misunderstanding, fundamentalist, and evangelical nut jobs in America. But we cannot do it. I can't do it standing in a building, screaming at the top of my lungs into a mic by myself. We have to build a church. And we need you to come and help us to do that. And uh, so if you live in the greater Huntsville area, Sunday it's at 3 o'clock, come be with us at the Century Office Center, 3322 uh, Memorial Parkway Southwest. That's just up the road a little bit from the mall there on Memorial Parkway on the opposite side of the highway. And we're in suite number 537. It's on the second floor at the very back of the 500 building. And uh, the 500 building is, uh, there's a few different structures there. Basically, the 500 building is the first building. As you're coming up, you know, the access road, you're going to see this kind of an orangey, gold-colored set of buildings. And we're the first building, but you go between the first and second buildings. And our unit is on the very back top right hand side uh, 537 and that's of course in uh, Huntsville, Alabama 35801 and I hope you'll come be with us uh, I believe that you'll find church can be a very positive experience and I think you'll find that uh, being around people who are literally striving to love and to support and encourage one another is a very positive and good thing. And uh, also then, of course, next Wednesday at 7 o'clock Central Standard Time, I hope you'll come join us for our next installment in this Bible study, LGBT Affirming Theology. Until we meet again, God bless you in Jesus' wonderful name is our prayer.